Thank you very much, Glaives. It's great to be here. I last saw Glaives uh, one year ago at uh, the Founders Breakfast for the Free Enterprise Institute Center for American Idea at River Oaks Country Club in Houston, and he did a, a great job in the keynote address there. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is um, a subject that is taken up in my book, Econoclasts, which is a history of supply-side economics, uh, which of course culminated in, in the Reagan Revolution in the early 1980s in a restoration of American prosperity to the historical trend. Um, Supply-side economics was born in the 1920s as a result of the Great Depression that didn't happen, uh, that of 1919 to 1921. And what I'd like to do today is, is simply discuss why the Great Depression happened in the early 30s and not in the early 20s when the conditions were just the same. We used to think that capitalism caused the Great Depression. Back in the 1950s, when John Kenneth Galbraith was writing, it became a common view that corporations, stock traders, the market, in a word, caused the incredible downturn of the early 1930s, whereby industrial production fell by a third and unemployment displaced fully one quarter of the national workforce. It was a crisis of capitalism, as the Marxists were prone to say. Quote, the massive literature on the causes of the Great Depression has generated more heat than light. So said economist Robert Mundell as he accepted the Nobel Prize in December 1999. Mundell was right. All the literature hanging the Great Depression on a crisis of capitalism was misplaced. Here's what we now know. The fingerprints on the Great Depression, on what caused it, are all those of the government. The chief cause, probably the sufficient cause in the Aristotelian sense of the Great Depression, was in particular the way the federal government bungled its management of the gold standard. Let me restrate, restate, this strange bird, this bungling of the gold standard, was the sufficient cause of the Great Depression. Or as Mundell again said in the 1999 Nobel Prize address, quote, had the United States raised the price of gold in 1928, there would have been no Great Depression, no Nazi Revolution, and no World War II. It was the greatest financial mistake in modern history, and the federal government of the United States is the one who made it. Over the next 20 minutes, I would like to explain this argument. The argument follows the life's work of Robert Mundell, the founder of supply-side economics, the Nobelist, and the greatest elucidator of this argument. Mundell's work, in turn, was based on economic research done in the 1920s, yet ignored at the time. Work done by such figures as Ludwig von Mises, Gustav Cassell, Charles Rist, John Park Young, and even John Maynard Keynes. Let's begin by taking a step back. Knowing why the Great Depression happened can only occur if we look into an earlier period and ask why a Great Depression did not follow World War I. The root cause of the decision that precipitated the Great Depression of the 30s, the bungling of the pricing of gold after 1929, this root cause itself was another US mistake, particularly on the part of the rookie Federal Reserve a dozen years before, during the period of US neutrality in World War I. Let me take you back to that time. From 1914 to 1916, while the European countries were at war in the Ottoman Empire, and the US was not, Europe bought an inordinate stock of goods from the United States. However, the United States bought nothing from Europe in return, because being at war, these countries were not producing things for sale. Therefore, in those two years, the United States took the logical move on gaining so much European currency that had no promise of buying goods and services, and redeemed those currencies for gold with the respective currency issuers, the European countries at war. What happened in that span is that a great part of Europe's monetary gold stock migrated to the United States, and indeed to other neutral nations who were not fighting World War II, such World War I 
such as Argentina, Spain, Japan, Holland, and Switzerland. In the space of two years, just two years, 1914 to 1916, US at peace, the monetary gold stock of the United States doubled. Here, the Federal Reserve, a green institution, green in the old sense, that is to say it was rookie, having only been born right before the war started in late 1913, made a momentous and flawed decision. The Fed chose to print dollars corresponding to the new gold coming in to the US. From 1913 to 1919, the quantity of dollars issued doubled, just as the quantity of US monetary gold doubled. The effect of this decision was to double one thing more, the price level. From 1913 to 1919, the consumer price index increased by 102%, much of it before US entry into the war in spring 1917. This was the only example of peacetime inflation in the United States to date. To holders of gold, and these included many average Americans, all this was an outrage. If you had an ounce of gold in 1913, you could get $20 from the US Treasury, then the government's official conversion rate. And in 1919, for that same ounce of gold, you could still get $20 for it from the feds. But $20 in 1919 could buy you half as much stuff as in 1913. By doubling the dollar stock in the face of the remarkable gold inflows and creating a mega inflation, the United States had unwittingly halved the real value of all monetary gold. This was a mistake. In 1919, six years into its existence and beginning to get its sea legs, finally, the Federal Reserve realized it had made a considerable blunder, this inflation and this having the real value of gold. So it tried to undo its mistake. From 1919 to 1921, the Federal Reserve proceeded to suck dollars out of the economy. It did this by various means, raising interest rates, raising bank reserve requirements, sterilizing new gold inflows. The results came fast, and hard. Prices dropped a deflation by 25%, meaning that the Fed was halfway there towards gaining back the 1913 price level. But you see what this mega now deflation after 1919 meant for the economy. Nobody wanted to spend money. By holding money, you got richer, a lot richer. By taking the price level, which was at 10 in 1913, from 20 to 15, from 1919 to 1921, people, <clears throat> the Fed made sure that people who held but did not spend dollars saw the value of those dollars increase by fully one third, which is 20 divided by 15. With the Fed giving every indication that this deflation policy was going to be maintained until the price level hit 10 again, the 1913 level, there was all the more reason to hold and not spend your currency. For 15 divided by 10 is 50%. If you deferred purchases until the Fed was finished, your money would quickly appreciate by half. So nobody spent anything. And from 1919 to 1921, the United States had the worst depression in its history. Unemployment, which hadn't even been a word 20 years before, hit 15%, perhaps 20%, as Amity Schley said last night, <clears throat> easily 50% higher than in any previous economic crisis. Massive strikes occurred, even though there were no unions, and all the blame was put on foreign agitators, as the likes of Emma Goldman were deported and packed off to the old world. It wasn't foreign agitators. <laughs> The only reason the incredible recession was occurring was that the Fed, of its own accord, was engineering a historic deflation. Finally, intelligence stepped in. New York Fed President Benjamin, Fr Strong, Benjamin Strong finally got hold of the board and told it to cut it out. In 1921, new Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon 
the Pittsburgh banker extraordinaire, who knew a thing or two about keeping businesses going, supported Strong's position. And he had Harding's support. And Harding should be considered perhaps a great president for appointing Mellon in this context. Both men, Mellon and Strong, implored the money master, the Fed, to stop deflation and inflation. Just keep prices stable at whatever level they happen to be at that point for the future. At the moment, this was where the consumer price index was at 16, or 60% 60 higher than in 1913. Keep it at 16 forever, Strong and Mellon said. The economy works best with permanently stable prices. If the CPI, the inflation rate, goes over 16, tighten money. If below 16, loosen money. Inflation, deflation, target these, you greenhorns, Strong and Mellon told the Fed. The Fed sheepishly <laughs> took the advice and kept the price level at precisely 60% over the 1913 mark for the next eight years, until late 1929. I don't think I need to tell you, we now know what happened in that span in those eight years, in the wonderful Harding Coolidge years. Quote, it was simply the brightest period in all of American economic history, as economic historian Richard Vedder has written of the Roaring Twenties. Economic growth was 4.5% per year from 1922 to 1929, an incredible sustained level. And when you participated in this great bonanza, you really did because prices stayed the same. Now, some of you might be thinking, based on what I said a few minutes earlier, hold it. If you held gold, you were still getting the shaft. In 1913, your ounce of gold could buy $20 worth of stuff, given the official US conversion price of $20 per ounce of gold, which never changed through the teens and the 20s. But $20 was worth less in the 1920s compared to 1913 because the price level was up by 60%. $20 in the 1920s could only buy $12.50 worth of stuff on 1913 prices. So if you had been holding gold, you were still losing pretty badly. Well, one further reform should have taken place in 1921, or for that matter, at any point during the roaring 1920s but did not. The US should have raised the official conversion price of gold by 60%. During the Roaring Twenties, no one much cared about this oversight because you wanted to get out of gold and into the dollar. The dollar could be used to buy investments on the marketplace, but gold cannot be so used. And with the stock market going up 400%, you wanted to be in the means of exchange, the currency, which you could use to buy stocks, as opposed to gold, which cannot regularly be used to buy securities unless converted into currency. However, once a little pause in the market might occur, you might think about quickly exchanging currencies for gold, because the US still had to get around to correcting the old mistake and raising the official price of gold by 60%. You could ride the market till it paused, quickly cash out, buy gold, and wait for a nice 60% appreciation on that investment in gold. Without a pause in the market, however, there would be too many stock gains still on the table for people to get out and cash in dollars for gold. For I think it's time we admit it, and there were clear suggestions of this last night, the 1929 stock market event was merely a pause, not a crash. For the calendar year of 1929, the Dow was flat. And from January 1, 1929 to April 1930, it was positive. That's no crash. It was a pause. The crash was from April 1930 to June 1932, when the market went to nil, from 250 to 15 but not by April 1930. And remember, the stock volume at the summer 1929 peak was small. All the brokers were on vacation. Well, with a pause, what should, in 1929, what should have happened did happen. People started cashing out dollars for gold, expecting a price spike in that medium. And then, oddly, 
there was a repeat of 1919 to 1921. The Fed suddenly switched its price stability policy of 1922 to 1929 and went back to what had failed a decade earlier. The Fed tried heroically, stupidly, to reclaim the 1913 price level. This obscure mistake is the single most catastrophic decision the federal government in all its branches has ever made. The Fed's defense of 1913 prices in the wake of the 1929 stock market event guaranteed not only a major deflation again, but a mass evacuation out of the means of exchange. If the Fed held to this policy for any length of time, a depression on the order of 1919 to 1921 or worse had to ensue. That the Fed did adhere to this policy from 1929 to 1933 is a prime reason that the House history of the Federal Reserve, the House history commissioned by economist Alan H. Meltzer of 2004 begins with these words, quote, the founders of the Federal Reserve did not intend to create a powerful institution. Had they been able to see the future, they would not have acted in 1913 to even create the Fed. After the so-called crash, think of 1929, the Fed raised interest rates and made other moves indicating that it was interested in erasing that extra six points on the price level. People got the hint, went to the bank, got out dollars, and cashed them in for gold at $20 an ounce. That is to say, a game of chicken ensued. Surely it was madness, and it was madness, for the Fed to engineer a 40% deflation over a period of several years. For as recent experience had clearly shown, a dozen years before, this would stop consumer demand in its tracks as people chose to hold currency and refuse to buy because currency is appreciating in value. Because it was abundantly clear after 1929 that all sense indicated that the Fed should once again, as in 1921, drop its full deflationary policy and keep the price level where it happened to be for the future, this left the government with only one realistic thing to do, raise the price of gold for the love of God. The Fed refused to do so. It said, darn it, we're not going to prove all of you right. And we're going to get the price level down to the 1913 mark so that gold will be correctly valued once again at $20 per ounce. There you have your Great Depression. Sure enough, 1919 to 1933, prices declined by a third and consumer demand, as could only be natural, completely dried up. Banks saw their deposits raided because all reason suggested one would still be well, well positioned in gold. That is to say, surely the Fed is going to quit austerity and concede to stable prices and a permanent increase in the price of gold. That's what everyone was expecting because that made sense. The problem quickly got worse in, than in a decade before. This time, in the early 30s, the government chose to deficit spend to counteract the recession engineered by the Fed. Hoover's deficits hit a whopping 5% of GDP per year by the end of his term. The problem with running deficits in deflationary periods is that the value of those deficits thereby soars, and it becomes difficult for governments to make payments on them. Deflation increases the value of government debt held. In the early 1930s, the United States was therefore wondering if it might default as deflation appreciated the size of Hoover's big deficits by 40%. Now this was different from 1919, 1921. Then the US was barely running a deficit, so it did not have to worry about its service payments going up massively in case of deflation. Under Hoover, however, the deficits were large, and service on them stood to be paid in future years in currency worth 40% more than in 1929. The government would have to rake in revenue beyond all comprehension to make those payments. Therefore, in the early 1930s, but not in 1919-1921, there came massive tax increases. 
The top rate of the income tax quickly went from 25% to 63%, then to 73%. The Revenue Act of 1932, by all accounts, was the most massive comprehensive tax increase in American history. You see the strange logic. The Fed and Treasury cause a deflation, the purpose of which is to justify a $20 price of gold. The deflation, in turn, causes a sharp recession because people hoard appreciating currency instead of spending it. To counteract this government-caused thing, the recession, the government deficit spends, Keynesianism avant la lettre, indeed sponsored by Hoover. But the financing of the deficit in this context is so challenging because of deflation that simply unheard of tax increases are required to keep the deficit within reasonable grounds. So huge tax increases result. But all these do is kill the business activity that the deficit had sought to stimulate in the first place. Public work stimulus and tax increases canceled themselves by 1932. So the fate of the economy was in the hands of the currency master. Would it continue to insist still on the $20 price of gold and continue to force the overall price level back down to the 1913 mark in the service of this objective? Amazingly and unconscionably, the answer was yes. Even Britain, which had done the same thing and tried to appreciate its currency after 1929 to make good on the pound's 1913 redemption rate in gold, gave up in September 1931 and announced the pound was no longer on gold. Not the US. It continued to defy the speculation against the dollar by keeping the official gold conversion rate at $20 and beating down the overall price level, getting it ever closer to the 1913 mark, a deflation. When FDR took office in 1933, he showed he understood the issues at stake about as well as Hoover had. FDR suspended the dollar's convertibility to gold in 1933 in imitation of the British and a move that made some sense, but only a little bit. But then, incredibly, FDR announced that the government, would, it would soon be illegal for Americans to hold gold. He set a deadline. All Americans would have to sell all their gold to the government at the old rate, $20, the going rate. If you had bought expecting a price spike, you weren't going to get it because gold holding was quickly becoming illegal. So Americans dutifully, lawfully gave up all their gold, one of the most fascistic examples in all of American history, in exchange for $20 for every ounce. Then, incredibly, the next year, in 1934, FDR raised the gold conversion ratio to $35 an ounce. The, the very move, the thought of which, had caused the five-year flight out of currency to begin with, indeed, which had caused the Great Depression. The federal government's 75% increase in the dollar conversion rate to gold in 1934 is itself sufficient evidence to indicate that the Great Depression came about essentially to court because this move had not been made five years earlier. What if, after all, immediately in the wake of the 1929 stock market pause, the United States had raised the gold price from $20 to $35 an ounce? There would have been no massive move out of stocks and bank deposits because the alternative to currency, gold, would have already experienced its resounding price increase. That the United States remained imperious about the old gold price after 1929 for five long years and tried to make that old price credible for those five years from 29 to 33 is why we got the Great Depression. And indeed, after 1934, the U.S. resorted back to the melon and strong price stability policy. The price level moved not a whit from 1934 to 1940. Hence, you saw a return of growth to the economy in those years. The growth was not as good by any stretch as in the decade before because the high tax structure set up by Hoover 
was there to damp down the economy as soon as it got going. There was also the residual effect of the Smoot-Hawley tariff, which in 1930 had tried to help out firms getting killed by the dollar appreciation by shutting out foreign competitors. So you see the fingerprints on this travesty, the Great Depression that gave way to the most hideous and destructive war in history. The causes of the Great Depression, if taken to a crime lab, come back as government, government, government. Fingerprints, DNA, everything. Everything except motive, of course. There was no maliciousness here, just incompetence and a lack of perspective. We now know, perhaps Ben Bernanke accepted, that permanent price stability is imperative for the economy to function well and to grow. If you're on a gold standard and you make a mistake and print too much money, by all means, raise the price of gold and commit to price stability at the new high level for the future. This was the lesson half learned in 1921. The US stopped its crazy deflation halfway through erasing the 1913-1919 inflation of 100%. That was an excellent, excellent move, the stopping of the deflation, and it kept prices steady at the new par for the next seven years, seven stupendous years that are among the greatest in the economic history of the world. In addition, the government should have made one more correction and increased the price of gold by 50% commensurate to the increase in the overall price level that was being conceded. And at every moment after 1929, the US had the opportunity to do this, to raise the price of gold, to staunch the flight from currency. And it took five years to see the light. Again, this is one of the worst episodes in decision making in the modern history of government. The lessons for today are fairly clear. First, government, not business, causes any economic crisis, as time in the case of 2008-2009 will indicate. Second, price stability is imperative. Most regrettably today, the common view, including in the halls of power, is that capitalism caused the current crisis. This is dead wrong. Massive instability in the means of exchange, the dollar, occasioned by Alan Greenspan's last years at the Fed, caused this crisis, as is the considered opinion, and this is a little known fact, of a majority of the world's top macroeconomists, led by John B. Taylor. Today, we sh and Anna Schwartz, Today, we should recommit to keeping the dollar stable in terms of its domestic purchasing power as well, of its rate, as well as its rate of exchange to other major currencies. This in itself will allocate resources towards price stability, will allocate resources towards real economic enterprises to a great degree. In addition, we should do the opposite of the fiscal and trade measures taken in the 1930s. We should cut taxes, restrain spending, and encourage world trade. Does that sound too pat for you? Think about it. What if right now the US took dedicated action to keep the dollar stable, taxes low, spending moderate, and trade open right now? Needless to say, we would, be, we would put our current crisis to pasture forthwith and start giving the Roaring Twenties some competition for the laurel of the most stupendous episode of non-inflationary growth and across-the-board prosperity that I has ever seen. Thank you. So we're going to start with a, uh, let's see, we're starting with this side over here with the discussion of why we should do active policy, which will sandwich nicely between uh, Brian's and the other side. So. Well, they elected me to go first. And um, with the way we divided this up, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, about what the monetary authorities are doing now and how that fits into the current situation. And then uh, Dan's going to talk 
about fiscal policy, I think, and Harry's, Harry's going to talk about regulatory reform. So um, first of all, we are, we, we are in a financial crisis. I'm not going to spend a lot of time discussing how we got there. Um, uh, I'll leave that maybe for the discussion session later on if you want to get into that. But what is a financial crisis? A financial crisis is a, is a situation where uh, people panic. Uh, nobody wants to hold risky assets. Nobody wants to hold assets that can fluctuate in price. So what happens is lending dries up and folks opt for safe assets. They opt for liquid assets as much as possible. This, can be a, uh, this leads to serious problems with economic activity because if you can't borrow money, economic activity uh, becomes, becomes a real problem. So what does the monetary authority do in these circumstances? Well, the first thing they have to do is they have to make sure that everybody who wants liquidity can get it, so flood the system with liquidity. The second thing they need to do is to make a market for distressed assets. Uh, if there are folks who can't sell financial assets that they have, that contributes to the panic. It contributes to the difficulty that businesses have raising money, that people have getting mortgages. So what the monetary authority has to do is make sure that there's a market for these things, sometimes by guaranteeing them, sometimes by financing private buyers, sometimes by buying the things themselves. Uh, but one way or another, we have to get back to a situation where financial assets can be traded in the normal manner, where for, for every seller there's a buyer at, at some price. The third thing they need to do is to make sure that insolvent institutions, insolvent financial intermediaries are closed. Uh, the worst thing in a panic is to, is to uh, have, have money that you've lent to a financial intermediary and then discover that that intermediary has disappeared and your money's disappeared with it. So we have to make sure that insolvent banks are closed. And then the fourth thing that has to be done is that if there are solvent companies that are nevertheless in a situation where their capital is impaired, uh, where they, they're, they're not technically underwater, but they're in a position where they can't continue to do business because they, they don't have, they don't have the, um, uh, the capital to uh, make new loans, uh, they have to be recapitalized. Right? And in a financial crisis, it's very difficult for uh, companies to recapitalize themselves um, because private buyers usually are very wary and they don't want risky assets. And that includes stock in banks and, and investment banks and insurance companies and the like. So that's what the Fed has been doing really since uh, about November of 2007. Uh, when it became apparent that the financial crisis was upon us. And uh, they began by flooding the system with liquidity, and they've been um, working on all four of these ever since, the Federal Reserve in connection with, uh, with the Treasury and with the uh, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and the other uh, uh, banking and, and insurance regulatory authorities. Until we get, under normal circumstances, we would rely on monetary policy to provide most of the stimulus to get us out of a recession. In most recessions, in <coughs> normal recessions, monetary policy is a very powerful and very effective tool for stimulating aggregate demand. And believe me, aggregate demand is the problem here. Um, under circumstances of a financial crisis, monetary policy doesn't work because the financial system itself is impaired. It's it's not working right. So during a financial crisis, the first priority of the financial authorities has to be to repair the system, get it back to the point where it's working normally. And because it's not working normally, the stimulus doesn't come from monetary policy. It has to come from somewhere else. And that's, of course, where fiscal policy comes in. And that's where I turn it over to Dan. OK. I think. I'll just sit here if that's all right, just and that way we can uh, speed up time a little bit. And, and so John basically led into my talk. I have a little bit of my notes here. I said, uh, in normal times, most economists are 
are content to let monetary policy do the work that needs to be done to moderate the business cycle. Uh, the problems with fiscal policy are, are well known. They're what are called uh, long and variable lags. When you, you recognize there's a problem, then you have to implement the problem, then before it actually takes effect. So in general, you know, if you look at the last 25 or so years, economists haven't talked about fiscal stimulus because we said we don't need it. Okay, in normal times, even with normal recessions, it's not something we'll worry about. But as John mentioned, these are not normal times. Uh, typically, we let monetary policy take care of things, but monetary policy right now has pretty much done everything that it can do. The Federal Reserve has turned on the spigots, money is flowing into the economy as fast as they can, can put it in there, and it certainly has helped alleviate the problems a little bit, uh, but certainly not to the extent that we think probably should be done. Certainly, the economy isn't working as well as it, as it could be working. Uh, to give you an idea of how bad things are, we all know how bad things are, but let me just kind of run down a list of a little bit of statistics to kind of tell you what's happened in our economy. Uh, we've had a decrease in consumer expenditure since the recession that's uh, worse than any other time since the Great Depression. Uh, in the last year, private investment decreased by 28%. This is, again, the largest decrease since the Great Depression. Uh, industrial production is down by 15%. This is the largest decline since we disarmed after World War II. Uh, we have the largest amount, even though the unemployment rate is not as high as it was in the early 1980s, uh, we've actually lost on a percentage basis more jobs than we have at any other time since the Great Depression. Uh, the unemployment rate right now that we know of is 9.8% nationally. Uh, that's a measure of people who would like to have jobs but can't find a job. The Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates alternative measures because that doesn't include people who are underemployed people who are working for involuntary part-time reasons. They'd like to be working full-time, but they're only working part-time. And there's other things that they put in there, too. And when they estimate this, uh, it's 17% of the labor force is either unemployed or, or underemployed. This compares in normal times, that number's about 9%. Uh, if we look at, so basically we have this you know, great underutilization of our labor uh, capacity. We also have a great underutilization of our capital capacity. We have machines and tools and factories that are sitting idle right now. Uh, typically, the, we have, you know, idle resources are in the teens. We have, you know, 17, 18 percent of, of our resources just aren't being used for whatever reason at a given point in time. Right now, the number is above 30 percent. So basically, we have an unemployment rate of capital above 30 percent. This is, a, again, the largest that that number has been uh, since they began taking these measures, and that was 45 years ago they started taking it. So basically, right now, uh, we have all of this productive capability that's just sitting there. It's not being used. Who can come in? Who can be? We, we talk about the Federal Reserve being the lender of last resort. If nobody else will lend to provide liquidity, the Federal Reserve can do it. We could view the government, in this case, as being the spender of last resort. We've had all these resources sitting there not being used. Let's put them to work. Let's put them to work productively. And the government actually can do this. And so that's one of the reasons I think that, that fiscal policy would be a useful thing to, to employ right now. Now, some of the typical objections to fiscal policy is that, and this is a standard one, is that it will crowd out private investment. And this is, this is true. You know, if the government it wants to you know, go sp spend a lot of money, they either have to get it through taxes by increasing taxes, which we're not going to do now, or they're going to do it through borrowing. Well, if the government starts borrowing money, that means private firms can't borrow the money. Under normal circumstances, that would be bad. But right now, the, the normal firms either aren't able to get the loans because the banking sector, the financial sector is not willing to provide them with the funds, but they are willing to provide the government with the funds because the government's viewed as being safer, or the firms just don't want to invest, period. So there's little chance right now. The amount of crowding out that's taking place right now is not very high. So in terms of the overall effect on long-term growth, fiscal policy isn't going to be that negative. Government spending, we often have this view that when government spends money, it does things, you know, stupidly. It wastes money. The government spends money. We all know, you know, there's a bridge to nowhere. We're going to build these things that are completely useless. And that's not necessarily the case as well. The government uh, can engage in productive investment. Okay? It might not be private investment. It could be government, uh, government investment in infrastructure. And there's been some estimates that have been done recently to look at, well, how well is this in terms of promoting economic growth? And some of the most recent estimates I've seen that just came out last month suggest that there's a multiplier effect of, of about 2% both in the short run and in the long run for government investment. And this would be government investment in infrastructure and things like this. So it doesn't necessarily crowd out uh, private investment. It, it might crowd it out a little bit, but it still is, is good for productive, productive uh, ends. I'll talk real quickly about just the current stimulus plan. People have said, well, is this having any effect at all? Uh, uh, right now, about $170 billion has been spent, either spent or has come back in tax cuts so far. Using a, a standard thing we have in economics called Oaken's Law, we can do a quick back of the envelope calculation. 
And that calculation basically says that we've, that's probably, uh, the amount of people that are employed because of the stimulus spend is probably about one million extra people right now are working because of that $170 billion has been spent than not. So there are some effects. You might not see it necessarily in the unemployment rate, but, but standard back the envelope calculations in economics suggest that that's the case. So that's basically the, the idea of, of fiscal stimulus. Now there's this productive capacity that we have that is not being used. The market for some reason is not finding a way to employ it. The government can. The government can pick up the slack here. And I'll turn it over to Harry. Thank you. John has talked about monetary policy, and uh, Dan has talked about fiscal policy. What I want to do is to talk a little bit about regulation. Uh, there's plenty of blame to go around in terms of what caused the current contraction. And part of it is regulatory failure in the 1990s. I think some of it is easy money, as the other side would say, and there's no doubt about that too. But in terms of uh, regulation, our view of regulation has changed over time. In the, in the old days, regulation was more in terms of price controls or in terms of the government trying to do more intervention in terms of directly doing what the market does. Most economists would agree that the regulation we want is to try to make the market perform better, to try to make the market work better. And in this case, there are three kinds of issues which come to the table. One is that we need more transparency in terms of what people are buying. Uh, if, if you take a common example, uh, a lot of the debt instruments which were restructured in the 1990s, there was loans sliced up and repackaged, securitized. No one really knew what they were buying. And they should have actually stopped buying at that point, probably. But uh, there was no transparency in these instruments, so-called uh, collateralized debt obligations, CDOs, and things like that. The other issue is that uh, there was conflict of interest in a lot of the decisions which were made at the macro level, and also in terms of the business institutions. For instance, uh, you could say that rating agencies who rated a lot of these uh, securitized packages gave them AAA ratings. Uh, there was a cozy relationship between these rating agencies and the fact that they were beholden to all, all these uh, financial and uh, corporate kind of clients who are giving them the business for floating new bonds, underwriting these new bonds. So there was a direct conflict of interest in terms of grading them you know, on an on a easy scale because they wanted more business from these guys. So these kinds of conflicts of interest have to be resolved besides transparency. Finally, the third mantra in terms of trying to create better regulation and better markets is this idea of accountability. In other words, if you take risk, you should bear the consequences of risk taking. Now, if, if, you, if you do that, if you put accountability in terms of risk taking, then the amount of risk taken will be moderate by itself. The market will discipline the amount of risk taken. If you can make loans and you can pass on these loans in a securitized package to someone else and just collect the loan origination fee, that means there's no skin in the game for you. You know, you get your $2,000, $3,000 in terms of the loan origination fee, and then you're done. You don't have to do due diligence in terms of what kind of lending you're doing or whether there's a high amount of default going on in the future. That's not part of, part of your decision making because you have no skin in the game. So these are the kind of issues we have to resolve at the regulatory level. So that's my mantra. Conflict of interest resolution, more transparency, and more accountability. Now, Obama has a package of uh, reform proposals up on the Hill, which is going to be debated pretty soon. And the question really is whether these, pack these package of regulations actually try to improve these three issues compared to what we have had in the past. And I sense, unfortunately, that this regulatory pendulum, there's a kind of a pendulum in the sense that for some time, we just don't regulate at all. In the 1990s, the Security and Exchange Commission, the SEC, and the FTC were kind of doing something like benign neglect. You know, they say, well, the markets can function. People are telling Ellen Greenspan to try to regulate some of this uh, easy lending which was going on in the late 1990s. And, you know, he's a, he's a believer of the free, free market. And he said, well, you know, the market will self-regulate itself. Unfortunately, a lot of that stuff did not happen because there was conflict of interest because there was lack of transparency, 
because there was lack of accountability. Now the question is, how do you actually try to create that? And let me just go very briefly in terms of what we need to do. And some of it is, is proposed in the, in the proposals which are up on the Hill. One issue is that if, if institutions are too large, they're too big to fail, something like AIG, think AIG, then these institutions have to be transparent. They have to be accountable. Otherwise, you know, they cause a, a large risk of systemic failure, the whole thing crashing down. A lot of these corporate executives who took excessive amount of risk because their compensation was based on excessive risk taking. I don't fault them for it. I mean, if you can make you know, a few hundred million dollars in three or four years, I think that's, that's you know, good decisions for you. But the compensation mechanisms were structured in terms of them taking too much risk and getting rewarded for those risks in the short term, rather than basing it more in terms of long-term performance. So these too big to fail institutions have to be more transparent and more accountable. The other issue is in terms of consumer protection, that consumers have to be protected. Of course, if consumers make wrong decisions in terms of borrowing money and buying a big house if they can't afford it, they should pay the consequences of that. But a lot of the uh, issues that relate to the consumer is that there was not full disclosure in terms of the kinds of loans made. And what they were buying into was not that transparent. So there has to be certain laws to try to make sure <coughs> that that information is available to consumers. And uh, in terms of uh, accountability, we have to make sure that the person who is taking the risk actually bears the long-term consequences of that risk, risk taking. So these are hard issues. We will grapple with them for a long time. But I think it's important to understand that the operation, how do you actually make these things operational, will actually make, in the long run, markets work more efficiently and uh, will sustain more growth in the future. Well, great. So we now have the case for active policy. Um, let's hear the other side. Good morning. I am the uh, Larry of the, this team of Gary, Harry, and Larry. <laughs> It sounds a little like Mo, Larry, and Gurley. <laughs> We've decided to divide up our time this way. I'll talk about uh, the past, the lessons of fiscal and monetary policy of the 1930s, and then uh, uh, Mo and Curly will deal with the, the present and, and the future. If you could imagine for a moment a thief who uh, goes door to door throughout a neighborhood, uh, gathering up all the loot that he can get his hands on, and then he runs to the local shopping mall and he spends it. If all you did was interview the people in the mall, in the, uh, the, the shopkeepers, you might easily be led to the conclusion that, th that this guy was a public benefactor because the shopkeepers are all gonna say, hey, this was great, he stimulated my uh, business, I'll hire more people if he'll come back and do that again. But you wouldn't be very thorough in your thinking. You would be ignoring uh, the wealth not created, the unseen, uh, that would have been directed by those to whom the loot actually belonged. And so much of our view of government spending, and of the 30s in particular, is skewed by this impaired vision. We saw some of that last night uh, with references to uh, FDR's programs like the CCC and the WPA. If you look at only what those programs did, it looks as though, wow, he's creating employment. But it doesn't consider the, uh, uh, the harm that other policies were, uh, was creating that uh, made the unemployment uh, as high as it was. Uh, this kind of impaired vision uh, is, is sort of like the drunk who stumbles up on a man's patio as he's barbecuing chicken on a rotary spit. And the drunk says, hey, fellow, what's the matter? Your organ ain't playing and your monkey's on fire. <laughs> you're, not, you're not seeing everything and you're not seeing things very clearly. We heard it said, last evening, and I about fell out of my chair when I heard this, that the 37 collapse was due to FDR cutting spending in 36, and therefore more government spending would have been uh, a good thing. Uh, but that ignores the fact that in 1937, what we got was the Wagner Act, the National Labor Relations Act, which empowered organized labor with vast new powers and a, a, a heightened level of militancy, the number of strike days 
from 1936 to 37 doubled from 14 million to 28 million strike days in this country. In 37, you also had uh, uh, Roosevelt going after business in a big way by calling for an 85% tax on corporate retained earnings, uh, which is not uh, calculated, surely, to imbue confidence in investment. Congress didn't give him one that high. It gave him one of 35%, bad enough. And in a year, it repealed that when it saw the harm that it had done. And of course, the problem with saying that if uh, uh, that the collapse in 37 was caused by a reduction in government spending, there are many problems with that. But it ignores this big one, and that is, how do you explain that after the war, when we had a drastic reduction in government spending, the economy finally boomed? You can't have it both ways. You can't say, well, when you cut spending by government, you you uh, hurt the economy, and the implication is when you raise spending by the government, you help it when you've got this remarkable recovery after the war and after Roosevelt was gone. You had a much more business-friendly administration under Harry Truman than you had under Franklin Roosevelt, which steadily and, and uh, raised taxes throughout this period as well. Uh, in fact, Roosevelt at one point called for a 98% top income tax rate. He didn't get it because some Midwest congressman came from states where they had a 2 or 3% state income tax, and they said, if he gets 98, how are we going to get our 3 or 4%? So they gave him one of 91%, again, bad enough, whereupon Roosevelt came back and by executive order imposed a 100% income tax rate on all incomes of $25,000 and more. I don't know about you, but uh, a 100% income tax rate on all income earned after 25000 would have depressed me. Uh, fortunately, Congress overrode that, so it didn't, uh, didn't last very long. Um, in any event, uh, it seems to me that we, to be thorough in our thinking, we have to look at not just what government does, but what the rest of us don't do because of what government takes from us to do what it does. Thank you very much. Well, of course, our side is not going to take this uh, sitting down. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's very important that we address the issue of how we got here. Uh, if what happened was market capitalism uh, was an abject failure and we got here because of uh, problems with the market system, well, then you have all sorts of arguments that you need government regulation. But if what happened was government drove you into the ditch in the first place, uh, then you have to say, well, maybe government should stop doing some of the things that it's doing, and maybe what it ought to do is something different, which would allow us as individuals and entrepreneurs such as Pete Secchia here uh, to come out and create wealth for, uh, wealth for everyone. Now, if we look at monetary expansion, which the federal government has been doing, of course, that is, as Brian pointed out, uh, what got us into the Depression in the first place, and that is what got us into the recession in the first place. Uh, John Taylor is, has, uh, and others have uh, uh, documented quite well uh, that the monetary expansion, uh, which was the thing that fed the housing crisis with Alan Greenspan, keeping the interest rate at 1% for over a year, and then increasing it from June of 2004 to 2006, increasing the interest rate to 5% from 1%, and what do we find? Then we find the housing bubble collapses. Uh, it is not a liquidity problem that we got ourselves into. It w it's an uncertainty problem. It is what we did was we, cr we have created uh, and currently are still creating what Bob Higgs from the Independent Institute calls regime uncertainty. No one knows what the rules of the game are. As Amity pointed out last night, you, s you save Bear Stearns, you let Lehman go, you save I I AIG. Now no one knows what the rules of the game are. Uh, not only that, but we created uncertainty through discussions uh, by the Secretary of the Treasury and the Fed Chairman. If you, as, as John Taylor's pointed out, if you look at the LIBOR OIS spread, which is a measure of uh, risk, uh, you find it doesn't jump very much when Lehman fails. Uh, what you find is that it jumps two weeks later when we have the Secretary of the Treasury uh, going into Congress and saying, oh my gosh, the world's coming to an end. Give us $700 billion by Friday. We're going to give you two pages of what we think we're going to do it. We're not really sure. Uh, help us out. And then on September 24th, you have the President of the United States saying to the, to the, to the uh, 
American people, financial assets related to home mortgages have lost value during the, last house, dur during the house decline, and the banks holding these assets have restricted credit. As a result, our entire economy is in danger. And when you hear the President of the United States saying our entire economy is in danger, it doesn't say, gee, maybe what you ought to do is go out, take some risk, loan to some banks, uh, expand the uh, capital assets of banks. And so the, it is this regime uncertainty that we continue to do. Uh, the government is then doing things that uh, Ludwig von Mises in 1927 said, look, what we're going to do is we're going to create uh, a depression, and then what's going to happen is that the uh, federal government is going to come in and do make works projects in a book called Liberalism. And of course, he says, and that's just not going to work, right? Because as Larry pointed out, you're going to just rob Peter to pay Paul. Uh, and, and yet, that is what we continue to do. The idea is that we're going to have all these public works programs and, and that somehow it is going to work. Uh, and then finally, what we're doing is we're taxing, right? We all, as Larry pointed out, one of the, one of the things that caused the second part of the, uh, the Great Depression was massive tax increases. What do you hear? We're going to have tax, we're going to have the tax and uh, uh, the cut and trade, uh, the cap and trade, ta it's going to be a tax increase essentially, right? It's going to be more costly to use things which take energy, which means to produce stuff. Then what do we have? We're hearing that you're going to be taxed if you uh, hire someone and you don't put in the health care program that the government decides that you need to put in to do that. Uh, and now we know we have the expiration of the Bush tax cuts are going to occur in January of 2011. What's that going to do? Double the tax on dividends. Uh, so what we've, we're doing today are all the things that are putting us in the wrong direction and all the things that we did during to cause the Great Depression and to keep us there even longer. And with that, I'll turn it over to Harry. Okay, th <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start with a story. I have a, I teach a number of bankers in our program, and uh, they all tell me we've got plenty of money. We just can't find anybody to lend it to who'll pay it back. <laughs> and um, the problem is with the financial system, if you imagine it as a waltz, and it takes two to waltz, okay? On one side, you have to have businessmen who have two characteristics, able and willing. In other words, they've got to be able to pay the money back, and they've got to be willing to pay it back. And on the other side, you have the financial system, which is able and willing to lend the money. And the secret of it is able and willing. Now, the problem that we have <laughs> that I see is that we distorted the economy, we distorted able and willing on both sides, particularly with the Community Investment Act, which ought to be repealed outright. Government should not be involved with directing credit. That should be left up to people who know what to do. In other words, we, we attempting to use monetary policy for social purposes has been a failure. And we've seen it in the housing crisis, and we spread this stuff all over the world. It's not the lack of government that's caused it, it's, it's government itself. Now, how do we restore the dance? How do we restore the partnership? The fastest way to restore business is to cut cost. And what I see in the Obama administration is, let's just take a look at the minimum wage. With a big argument from all the social people, we had to raise the minimum wage, whatever else. Well, youth unemployment, especially where I come from, is approaching 50%. So what people are finding out is it's a lot it's a lot more economically feasible to hire retirees than to hire young people. And when I go into McDonald's, who do I see? I see people my age helping me for hamburgers. Why? Because if you're going to pay a high wage, you want to get some quality out of it. In other words, why are youth wages lower? It's because they're not yet disciplined into the system. So what I'm saying is, is that what we should do is lower regulation. We probably should, I don't, know, I don't think it's politically possible to repeal the minimum wage, but it ought to be done. It would certainly bring youth employment back. The Community Investment Act ought to be gotten rid of. And the regulations ought to be lessened. Now, if any of this goes through, cap and trade, the, the medical thing that he's talking about, or any of the other are, are not, not renewing the Bush uh, tax policies, if any of it goes through, it's going to make this thing last longer. Because what's happening is, is that we got to restore people's balance sheets. The problem is the balance sheets are distorted. 
And as you allow costs to fall, and that was the secret of supply side economics. When I can go out in my boat, you see? So what happens is as you lower those costs, suddenly what happens, you ignite the engine. And as you lower cost, suddenly when a person goes into a bank to get a loan, he has a nice business plan. They can uh, show that our costs are low, we're gonna generate profits. And once that banker sees that, he says, yes, this is someone I can lend money to. And that starts the engine, that gets it going. So the last thing I would think we need is, is more government. Uh, it caused this problem. Why Alan Greenspan, who knew Ludwig von Mises, could allow that credit expansion to happen twice under his regime is beyond me. But he did. And the credit, all as an expansion of credit falsely, as the interest rates are lowered falsely, it creates distortions, and that's what we're working out now. So my call would be for a less, lot less government intervention. I think we go back to the secret of the supply side that Reagan did. Remember, Reagan lowered regulation, he lowered taxes. What did that do? That stimulated the economy because it created good balance sheets on the part of people going into banks. When people have a good balance sheet going into the banks, the banks are willing to lend money, and then what happens? People get hired, investment starts to happen, and you start to cycle again. So uh, I think the, the worst thing we could do, and, and if, if um, the, this administration continues to increase cost, and that's what this is, everything this administration wants to do is to increase cost, you're looking at probably a 10-year uh, problem. Okay, like we had in the 1930s, because that's what Roosevelt and Hoover did. They raised cost. It's lowering costs that makes the economy work. Thank you. Okay, we've now sort of set up some issues, and uh, we have a nice little break here for. Um, next step is to ask. Questions. We're going to start with them asking their questions. We're going to have uh, the people coming through to look at your question cards so we can get those in. Um, and so they finish. So you guys can start with uh, a question of the opposite side. You can build in a little one minute rebuttal if you want um, to keep things going. All right. So which person's moving on this? I've, I've got a couple. Um, I, have, I have a couple of questions uh, that, that uh, intrigue me here. Um, a number of you have made Alan Greenspan out to be the villain in this piece because he, uh, be, because he kept interest rates low uh, during the middle part of this decade and uh, supposedly caused the housing bubble. Yet at the same time we're told that the main job of the Federal Reserve, and this is something Brian said in his keynote, is to keep the price level steady. And that's not that's not the price of one particular asset. He made that quite clear. He, the, the point was not to stabilize the price of gold. The point was to stabilize the general price level. Um, most of us think that Alan Greenspan, and, and certainly Alan Greenspan thinks that Alan Greenspan did a very good job of, of stabilizing the overall price level. Now the question is, how was Greenspan supposed to stabilize the general price level while at the same time targeting the price of a specific asset, namely housing in the, in the 2000s and, and the stock market in the 1990s? Um, yes. Wasn't he following the Taylor rule? Yes, right. Okay. I, I think, uh, in a way, I disagree with um, targeting the price to the price level. I would prefer to target it to something that external discipline like the price of gold or um, keeping the currency stable in international markets rather than the price level. Because the problem is with the price level is you're always behind the ball. You're always doing yesterday's price level and trying to adjust it to tomorrow. So in a sense, I would, um, I'm not in agreement with uh, a lot of the supply siders who say it's the price level. I think we need an external discipline like we had with Bretton Woods or we had under the gold standard where, where it's targeted to something external. And I, and I would like to just add, he, w he was not following the Taylor rule. In fact, John Taylor's little book here has a diagram that was in The Economist uh, that showed that, in fact, the federal funds rate was substantially below the Taylor rule from about mid-2001 uh, up until finally 2007. If you, if you take a look at the price level and the BLS statistics, what you find is that prior to, prior to the breaking of Bretton Woods, 1971, 
between 46 and 71, the price level about doubled. Since 25 years after that, when we broke Bretton Woods, the price level quadrupled. Can I add something real quickly about Alan Greenspan, nobody's going to call him blameless in this whole thing, but if we look at 2005, I mean, he had raised interest rates, what, 17 times, but it didn't have any effect on long-term interest rates. The yield curve flattened, and that's basically what they called the conundrum. The, you know, Greenspan said it's the conundrum, and they couldn't explain why couldn't he boost long-term interest rates. So it wasn't the, the Fed doesn't control long-term interest rates, and that's really what the problem in the housing bubble was, not necessarily short-term rates. So there were other things going on there too. There was a lot of money coming in from abroad. There was this huge glut of global liquidity. Not all of it came from the Fed. I'm not saying the Fed is blameless, but not all of it came from the Fed. I have a question for the other side. Uh, you guys put a lot more faith in uh, what is called fiscal policy than I think we would. And uh, so my question is this. Uh, when I think of fiscal policy, which has been elevated to a kind of science of wise people, you know, like the, like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain who's manipulating everything, he'll know just exactly what to do. But when you pull the curtain away, you discover you've got 535 squabblers who are doling out money by the trillions for all sorts of political payoffs and pork barrel. Uh, <coughs> many of them don't have a clue what they're doing, and most have not run so much as a lemonade stand. So I'm wondering, on what basis do you grant politicians in Washington such enormous authority to regulate the economy by their habits of spending? Let me reply to that in two ways. One is that fiscal policy in the long run should be responsible in the sense that we should try to make sure that the federal budget is solvent in the long run. The problem here is that in the last eight years, we ran a, a, a historic deficit during good times. So when you run a real big deficit during good times, in bad times, I think we, we had a debate uh, last night, and uh, there was no credible alternative to government spending in the short run to bring the economy back when there was systemic failure. There was no credible alternative during the Great Depression when everything crashed, except the government to bring it back, at least in the short run, and there was no credible alternative now in terms of government stimulus package to try to bring it back, at least in the short run. In the long run, clearly, the Federal Reserve, the Federal Government has to balance the budget and try to reduce government spending down the road. The other issue we have talked about a lot recently is the nature of government spending. And you should, uh, it should be clear that there are certain kinds of spending which the private sector is not going to do the private sector does not invest in basic R&D. Basic R&D just has two uncertain long-term payoffs. It's the federal government which spends a lot of money on basic R&D. That's the reason why when the Nobel prices are announced, you know, 90% of the Nobel prices are in America. Why? Because of the fact that we have a lot of money going into basic R&D. Now the private sector can take that basic R&D and make a lot of product-related development from that basic R&D. The second issue is government has to spend on education. This whole idea of uh, reneging on Michigan promise, if you don't allow students in the middle class to come to universities to get skills, if you renege on the Michigan promise in terms of subsidizing the education, we are going to position ourselves for failure in the future because we're not going to have the skills for the workforce we need. So, Government has to spend on infrastructure. Government has to spend on basic R&D. Government has to spend on education. The private sector cannot do these things and historically have not done these things because the benefits are to society at large. Education has a benefit to the person who educates, but economic results show that there's a social return to education, which is almost as big as the private return to education. That's why, that's why the government needs to subsidize it. So these kinds of government expenditures are really necessary for future growth, for the private sector to kind of develop that kind of economic engine, which normally comes in terms of expansion. It's the private sector that's going to grow the economy, but the foundation in terms of R&D, education, and infrastructure has to be there. Yeah, let me. How, how good is the, uh, uh, is the government of thinking long term? The private sector has not saddled us with a single program like Social Security that has $75 trillion of unfunded long-term 
or I'm sorry, $8 trillion in unfunded long-term liabilities over the next 75 years. The prescription drug program started only in the last administration is now $9 trillion in the red in terms of unfunded long-term liabilities. Uh, and on down the list. So I'm not sure where you're coming from to suggest that government is the long-term thinker. It's the long-term saddler of, uh, of massive debts that will have to be paid for out of the productivity of the private sector. There, there are a lot of businesses who can't seem to think beyond the end of the next quarter, actually. And that's, and that's part of what got us in the trouble we're in with the financial sector. But they, they go broke, though. No. They're not there for the next 75 years uh, getting ever higher taxes from us. But one thing, <clears throat> one thing I would say, I agree with Harry on the fact that the, at a certain point, monetary policy doesn't work, and we're at that point now. It isn't that we're rejecting fiscal policy, but we're saying there's a different fiscal policy, and that fiscal policy is fiscal policy of lowering costs to business, which stimulates. That's the difference, I think. We, well, I think both of us agree on fiscal yeah. policy is the way to go. It's that, a, that raises another question, though. You said that the, 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 the fastest way to restore business is to cut costs. Well, if you cut costs and you don't have any customers, how, how does that restore your business? Because prices come down. You can be, you're able, you become price competitive and prices come down. There's nothing that generates customers like lower prices. I mean, I mean essentially, I, you shift yeah. the supply curve words, to the right. In other right. words, and would, prices will fall and quantity will go up. Yeah. Well, I, I would be in favor of cutting costs. I, I think it's, yeah. it's very important to cut costs, to have targeted tax cuts for investment. Yeah. And you talk about cutting costs, one of the biggest costs right now in American business is health care. I mean, in small, in small businesses, people can't get insured because the cost of insurance is so high. Sure. But you know, the interesting thing is talking about cutting costs is the one area of medicine that has been consistent with inflation is cosmetic surgery. And the reason is there's no thir third party payer. So I think the, the more intelligent way to cut costs in medicine would be the, um, the, the, this plan where they have the health, uh, uh, like a health IRA plan and then, the, um, and then allowing competition across state borders and in insurance. Because as soon as it let, let the insurance companies compete so I can buy insurance, say, in Texas, or I can buy insurance in, in Illinois, where it would be cheaper, where you introduce competition, I don't think the government stepping in uh, will do it, because most, most experiences with government coming in is cost rise. We, we can debate health care, but yeah. you know, the, the issue about health reform is that about 20 to 30 percent of the expenditure in, in the health sector, in the private sector, is on gatekeeping costs. That means they hire a slew of people to try to prevent persons from getting insured by excluding them and trying to deny them different kinds of stuff. So about, there are different estimates, but, but 20 to 30 percent of the expenditure in the private industry on healthcare is these kind of gatekeeping costs which are completely wasted yeah, but, and but, which could uh, actually be, be actually used to provide services to the general public. But we have to come back to why the healthcare costs look the way they do. And my argument would be, if you look back to World War II, where we started wage and price controls, the private sector responded to that, said, well, how can we get around these wage and price controls? I can provide health insurance. We have 70% marginal tax rates, which say, if I give you a dollar's worth of health care, you get a dollar's worth of health care. If I give you a dollar and you go out and buy it yourself, you only have 30 cents to do that. Then in 1951, the Congress, the, the IRS says, oh no, that's taxable income. Congress responds and says, oh no, we're not going to make that taxable. I mean, there's absolutely no reason when you go and get a job that you expect them to give you health care, but you don't expect them to give you car insurance. You don't expect them to give you life insurance or homeowner's insurance. What's magic about health insurance? The magic about health insurance is it's heavily regulated by state and federal government, and it's the same thing. The government drove us into the ditch in health care, and the response has been, as Bob Higgs says in Crisis and, Le Crisis and Leviathan, the response is, let's let government do more of it. Right now, total expenditures on health care, 49% of it, government spent through Medicare, Medicaid, and, and public employee health care programs. If we think that we're going to bring health care costs down by having the government spend 100% of the expenditures on health care, we're just nuts. 
Well, it would bring business costs down. I mean, why, why do you hire retirees? Well, you hire retirees instead of young people because their health costs are subsidized by the government and they're on Social Security. So, so you're getting a good deal with that elderly folks that you're not no, getting. No, qu it, no question it might bring the cost to me, Ford Motor Company, down. But it doesn't make it less expensive to make health care. It doesn't bring, and, and how am I going to pay for that? Well, we all would like to have someone else pay for our health care, right? I mean, I'd just soon have the government pay for my health care as well. But as Larry pointed out, in the end, they got to get the resources from somewhere. And, it, and it's not, and, and despite what one of our speakers said last night, you know, it doesn't come from heaven. It comes from Washington. Well, well, how does it get to Washington? Out of your pocket. But well, what's magical, you asked what's magical about health care. What's magical about health care is that we don't believe that it's morally right to deny health care to people because they can't afford it. But why and is that, it that, that, why is it that, that employer is provides the basis it? On, on, which, on which we have a problem? Because that means that if somebody can't afford it and gets health care, the rest of us pay anyhow. Well, what we reason, have to organize well, what this the intelligence. Employer that pays? Because it helps out with adverse uh, adverse selection moral hazard problems. You have a pool in your employment, you have a pool of people and they're not going to self-select in or out. If you have to go buy in, you know, health insurance on your own, you know, then they're going to try to, they can't screen out good candidates from bad candidates, so they're going to have to set an average premium. And if I look at that average premium, I'm relatively healthy, I'm going to opt out. I'm going to say, I'm, I'm not going to pay for health insurance. It's too high because I'm a healthy person. So what happens, you're left with just the sick people and then they're going to, the insurance companies aren't stupid. They're going to say, well, the sick people have, you know, higher costs. We're going to raise the premiums there and you get this split premium. So this are split you get this non-equilibrium where you get healthy people won't be able to buy insurance because it's too expensive. So we talked about Medicare. The dirty little secret about Medicare is that the administrative cost in Medicare is very low because the criteria is very simple. Once you're above 65, you get health care. And again, you know, the site has not responded to the issue that in private insurance, about 30%, 20 to 30% of the cost of running that, their insurance company is basically gatekeeping costs which are a dead weight loss. They don't give benefit to anybody, except they create adverse selection in the sense that if you have a pre-existing condition and you're working in a small business, you're out of luck. You can't get insurance. Even the employer can't buy the insurance because it's just too expensive to insure you know, 20 or 50 persons if one or two of them have a long-term disease. So the problem is that you have to have a large pool and every individual should have the right to buy insurance. And I agree that they should pay deductibles they shouldn't demand too much services, so they should bear a large portion of that expenditure. But every American needs to have the right to buy insurance in a large pool so that the cost can go down. If you're just negotiating by yourself, you know, and if you have a pre-existing condition, you're just out of luck. And it's, it's immoral, I think, to put people out in the cold just because they have a pre-existing condition. I think the problem you cite would go a long way to being alleviated if we, as uh, either Gary or Harry have already mentioned, if we allowed uh, people to purchase health insurance across state lines, uh, which we currently don't, and if state governments got out of the business of piling on unfunded uh, uh, health benefit mandates. In state after state, you've got, uh, here in Michigan, we've got dozens of requirements on insurance companies. If you want to sell insurance here, you have to include coverage for, fill in the blank, and every year it's a debate over a half a dozen new ones. All of these cost money. And as much as 25% of the uninsured in this country uh, don't have insurance because they can't afford or their employer can't afford the high cost of state mandated health benefits. If I don't want coverage for drug abuse uh, treatments because I don't use drugs and don't plan to, I shouldn't be forced to buy it. Or hair, hair transplants in Minnesota, believe it or not, is required. Oh. Okay. Well. Um, we need to get back to the uh, to the depression talk as opposed to the uh, the health talk, and I have the unenviable position of being able to stand between these people. We're going to take a quick five minutes here for those of you who have to take off to work in classes, um, and then we're going to go through the questions. Just be aware that I assume this will be up on the iPod area of Hauenstein. Is that correct? Okay, so it will be up. So if you're having to leave, you can get these questions tonight. Okay, um, so don't feel shy about leaving. We're going to go through a good pile of these questions and we will be done by 10. All right. But enable those same stores to cut prices to attract more customers and to spend more money to use for their uh, families. So. 
So, so the, the, the question is to try to reduce the Michigan business tax versus spending stimulus money. On storefronts. <laughs> on storefronts particularly? Well, I know nothing about storefronts in Big Rapids, but I do know that, that businesses compete on a lot of things besides price. And uh, some of it is the attractiveness of the environment. I mean, you don't want to go into an old, grungy-looking store, do you? <laughs> you, you, you only care about price, I take it. That's, that's the only thing you care about. I, I care about other things, too. I mean, my wife, there are a lot of cheap restaurants my wife won't go to because they're too dirty. You know, doing, updating, updating buildings is an important competitive strategy for businesses. Well, I would, uh, now, I would uh, disagree slightly with John in the sense that I don't think government should direct where the private sector should be spending their money on their own business, clearly. So, you know, right, so, so spending a, tying the stimulus money only to the storefront and not allowing the business person to decide where it should be spent is not a very good idea. But I think reducing the Michigan business tax in the long run is also very important in terms of cutting costs, for sure. I think, I th I think we'll all agree that cutting taxes, no one really likes taxes. Cutting taxes in the long run, particularly business taxes, lowering their cost so that they can have a larger growth in the future is, is very good policy. The problem is that tax cuts are not a very good stabilization tool. They're not really very good for fine-tuning the economy at a time when there's the whole kind of uh, you know, economic uh, downturn which we have right now. So uh, basically, taxes, cutting taxes are good for long-term growth, but they're not very good for trying to bring the economy out in the short run. In the short run, the government stimulus and the monetary stimulus are much more effective measures to bring the economy out. Let me make a comment real quickly about that. In general, I think most economists agree that, you know, the market is better than the government at, at choosing what to invest and choosing what to uh, produce. You're, you're going to get growth. I mean, look at 20th century history. It's the markets that basically uh, worked. And so that's why most economists don't think that fiscal policy should be used too often in terms of fighting the downturns and things like that. But this is why I wanted to come back a little bit to the idea that there are invest, you know, there are infrastructure investments like in education, uh, highways, and things like this that are productive. So when we talk about stimulus spending, you could find a million, well, maybe not a million, but you could find a lot of things in there that most economists are going to look and say that's a complete waste in terms of what this bill is. There were a lot of things thrown in that, that economists are going to say that wasn't a good uh, use of the money. But there were also a lot of things in there that, that were a good use of the money. So the question is, was it, did it make sense for the government to do this at all? The reason I would argue it didn't make sense to do it now is because in this sense, it's not that the government is competing against the private sector in terms of getting the money to do it, because right now the private sector isn't using it. So we have these unused resources, and if the government can put them to work effectively, and, and that's okay, if, and some people are going to believe the government can't do anything right. Most, if you believe that, then, then disregard everything I say, because it doesn't matter. But if you do think that the government can do some things right, now would be a good time for the government to actually say, okay, now we can do it because we're not hurting businesses, because businesses aren't, we're not taking resources away from businesses because they're not using them anyway right now. So now we can fix the highways. Now we can build the schools and things like this that are going to be good for long-term growth. Yeah. Uh, I certainly can't defend that trillion and a half in stimulus spending uh, or any of it for things like private storefronts. And, and one reason is, I think we've forgotten this in this country. We do have something called the Constitution, and I can't find anything in there that says that it's the duty of the federal government to throw money around for private storefronts. Now, if we're going to do that, then why don't we just finally stop pretending that we have a Constitution and tear it up and say, you guys can just do whatever you want, whatever you feel like it. Uh, uh, but more importantly, here's the dirty little secret of the... Uh, of the two back-to-back -back stimulus spending programs, the big one, the 787, and then the subsequent budget thing, totaling about a trillion and a half dollars passed in a matter of months uh, last year and early this year. If you look at, do you know what the total amount of personal income tax revenue is to the federal government this year? It's about a trillion and a half dollars. So the government could have achieved the same thing by just saying for one full year, nobody will have to pay a penny in personal income tax as a kind of stimulus. Okay? Now, why didn't they do that? I mean, after all, their stimulus package, they're months into it, and they've only spent 10 percent of it. Why didn't they just say, if we're aiming for a trillion and a half, we'll just let you keep a trillion and a half? Can you imagine the stimulus we'd get if you didn't have to pay any income? Yeah. The difference is, uh, if it's left in your pocket, 
It doesn't empower politicians. You get to spend it. You, they don't get to pass it out to their friends. Yeah. That's the difference. The di but if, suppose we decide to do that. Well, okay, I guess we go a year without a military. No, no, you know, no. we go a year no. without a court system. We don't, you know, how do we protect the property rights it, if we don't? It, we didn't wait a minute. Uh, it, the total income tax revenue is only one and a half trillion, okay? Which is the total that the government took in and spent for everything early in the Bush administration. So we're only talking about ratcheting government back by a few years. And if they're going to spend an, a new trillion and a half to stimulate the economy, why wouldn't it be better to just let people keep a trillion and a half? Because they might not use it to stimulate the economy. They might use it to pay down their debts, they, which maybe with, they might use it to buy foreign products. But politicians who can't in months now spend more than 10 percent of it somehow are going to stimulate the economy more than you and I when, when it's in our own pocket. And the reason they didn't spend more than 10 percent of it is because they didn't want to waste it on storefronts. They wanted to say, okay, what projects are good? What investment projects are good? We can't, there aren't that many shovel-ready projects. This recession is going to last a period of time. These are good projects. We'll put them in place now. We'll put them in place that way. So, that, so there's sort of a, 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 you know, a decision they have to make. Do we do immediate short-term stimulus that may not be long-run productive, or do we invest in things that might have more productivity that can't get built right immediately today. And so you're going to hit it no matter what they do. But Dan, uh, at the core of what you're saying is basically this. People who actually sweat and earn and work and produce and take risks and build businesses, I'm not sure if we can trust them with their money. If we take it from them and have politicians spend it, well, then we're more sure of stimulating the economy. And I'm sorry, I look at the way these guys behave in Washington, and I ain't buying it. <laughs> I'm also saying, though, that we have 17% of our labor being underutilized or not utilized today and more than 30% of our capital being underutilized, so we're trusting people to do it, and for whatever reason, the market isn't using it. The market's not using these resources, so, I, I, again, I, we trust markets. I mean, uh, there's some of my students in here, at least they were earlier, from 365, and that's the whole lesson compared to economic systems, that markets work. You know, trust the market more than you trust the government, but right now the market's not allocating the resources. I mean, we're just letting that stuff sit there and not be used, and that's a waste, let a me, huge let me, waste. Let me respond in a different way. Do you really think the private sector is going to invest in infrastructure when the rate of return is so low? Do you think the private, do you think the private sector is going to invest in education? I mean, I don't see uh, a lot of free loans for students. Oh, wait do, you think, do you think the private sector is going to invest in R&D? The what, private is sector the, what is the total investment in R&D, basic R&D now, not, not product-related R&D? What's the total amount of basic R&D which the private sector has put into the economy? Every, every company of any size invests in R&D. Product R&D, not and, basic R&D. Not the kind which wins Nobel Prizes. And well, not yeah, but, but, but Just one, one, one point I'd like to make on this issue about education, right? Have you ever heard anyone say, we now, that the government invests in education right now, K-12, in the state of Michigan. I was deputy state treasurer here. I know we spend a lot of money on K-12 education, okay? Now, have you ever heard anyone say, gee, I want to move to the city of Detroit so I can send my kid to Detroit public schools? Have you ever heard anyone say that about Cleveland public schools or Baltimore public schools or Philadelphia public schools or Atlanta public schools? I mean, come on, look. The private sector made this thing, right? I can, I, I can do things on here I don't even know how to do, and yet you're going to tell me I can't teach a fourth grader to read? Something's wrong with the system. And the difference is this thing's produced by the private sector, and K-12 education in our urban centers is produced by the government sector. Well, K-12 education everywhere is produced by the, by the public sector, and a lot of right. places it works. The, the reason why public sector education does not work in Detroit and works in East Grand Rapids and Forest Hills is because the parents are more committed to supporting their kids. So it's, it's a question of inputs. The kind of inputs coming into the school are pretty bad in urban school districts, you know, which are tough neighborhoods. So it's not the teachers themselves who are to blame, or the public sector per se, but the fact that the students are not getting enough support from their parents in terms of education. Do you think unions have anything to do with it? <laughs> well, not much. If the private sector were to fail, it would be failing in East Grand Rapids too, or Forest Hills, right? It's not failing there, Look, it's but, failing in Detroit. But, but, Ask yourself why. Adam Smith said, I don't rely upon the benevolence of the butcher, the baker, the brewer for my dinner, but rather on their self-interest, which merely meant is that the system, the markets, rewards innovation and it rewards, but you know what? He never said, I won't get a benevolent butcher. But there are lots of fine public schools. But before and, we, and because you, but the problem is you rely on the benevolence of the butcher. Like but, Hillsdale, High, Hillsdale Public Schools, great public school, but you know, the, the problem is the system as a whole 
obviously fails us because we're, we're losing generations of children in our urban centers. And I would argue that the private, if you allowed the private sector to produce education. And the, you know, and the oops. failure of the financial system shows us what happens when, when we rely exclusively on people's self-interest and people don't think about how about their role in the system and behave responsibly. Yeah, this how quote, is this quote, this quote about uh, Adam Smith is misquoted so many times because you, re you don't rely on the benevolence of the butcher, that's true. But before Adam Smith wrote the, we the Wealth of Nations, he also wrote the Theory of Moral Sentiment, which basically makes an important point that the market has to function with a certain kind of morality not, not corporate greed run and mock. You know, so well, basically, yeah, I go back to my three points I made. Sure. You want to make the market function better. But, but as John is saying, if you leave the market completely alone, but here you know, I, it goes into many different kinds of spasms in terms of speculation and a lot of risk taking. Okay, but how do you, how do you explain the fact about. that, that <laughs> right. uh, okay. How do you explain the fact that in the, in the cities, in the inner cities where you have Catholic, the Catholic school students are outperforming the public school students. They're not having the same amount of trouble. And, they're, and by constitution, they cannot be subsidized by the government. I mean, I went through, I went through my entire education through, through the Catholic system. There was no government aid at all. And uh, they consistently have outperformed it. Lutheran schools have outperformed it. It's what yeah, Harry said. It's about the about inputs. It. Uh, this, is, this has been uh, 10 minutes on one question, and we have 20 <laughs> questions. So, so we're going to be doing two minutes a question, one minute and one minute, all right? Um, and the next question is just as big. How does the new global economy impact what is currently happening in our economy, and, what are, uh, and how does that affect this type of stimulus or non-stimulus, as the case may be? Well, I think if you take a look at the global thing, all the financial markets are calling for currency stability. I mean, the G20 want currency stability. Uh, Russia and China have come out for, they, they've actually said the word gold standard, which almost fell over. I mean, but both countries are saying, we don't want this instability in the dollar. And I think, I think one of the things that, as the, the stimulus package, as the Fed steps in to buy those bonds and creates more money, that's going to create instability in the international markets. It's going to create instability in the dollar. And I think that's a ma major mistake. Well, my, uh, I, I think if you read the G20 communique, they don't talk about the stability of exchange rates. They talk about rebalancing. They talk about cases where countries are running persistent deficits and persistent surpluses. We in the U.S. have to get our house in order. We have to, as a country, private sector and public, uh, start living more within our means. You know, one of the, one of the untold stories about this whole downturn in, a, in global terms is that the, the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, China and India are slowly getting more power, you know, and, uh, and in fact, one of the, there was a news item in NPR yesterday saying that the central banks all across the world are actually stocking up more on euros rather than the American dollar, which is not a good sign. No, I agree. That's, that's my point. Yeah. All right. We have agreement. There's a good one. <laughs> all right. So this one was addressed to uh, Gary, Larry, and Harry. Um, it seems that you, have a, uh, that you assume if prices go down, people will spend. Why? I'm not sure I saw that. But. Well, uh, what happens is over, over the period of time, when, peop when prices go down, all of a sudden people have more options. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, let's say get when gas was 450 a gallon, now I don't have the statistic with me, but when it dropped to around $2 a gallon, that, that provided more stimulus than, than the Bush package did. Because all of a sudden people have more money in their pockets and their options open up. And what are the options? Well, suddenly they could pay off debt, which I think is a good thing, paying off debt, frankly. Um, I'm surprised that here in Grand Rapids, the Dutchman here, I don't want that, but in any event, uh, they would pay off debt. They would uh, begin to have more money in their pockets. So I think falling prices are a good thing. I mean, Henry Ford brought the price of a car down from $2,000 to 200 and created the automotive boom here. So I mean, uh, if, you're, if you're passing on if you're passing on uh, productivity dividends to the public by lowering costs, lowering prices, because of, and Henry did that, why? Because he lowered the cost in the plant. He lowered the cost of the plant, passed it on. I think that's the best economics you can get. Yeah. Well, can I rebut that a little bit? I, I think everybody would agree that when prices go down, consumers buy more. But at a time like the Great Depression, or like in 2008, when there's paralyzing fear, you know, even when prices go down, people don't buy that much. 
because their confidence is so down. That's why, that's why the government sector is the only sector which can step in to restore confidence. The private sector investment is down, consumer expenditure is down, exports are down. There's nothing which is propping up the economy. Well, you certainly need, in addition to falling prices, you need a climate of certainty and you need an absence of fear. But this idea that somehow uh, the fear and the uncertainty was all generated in the private sector and the government had to rescue us is absurd. At the same time you had falling prices, throughout the 30s you had Roosevelt jacking up taxes into the stratosphere. You had uh, erratic monetary policy of the Federal Reserve. You had uh, the NIRA and the AAA uh, uh, destroying crops and cattle and paying uh, uh, to, uh, to have that destruction. You had all this craziness uh, that, that created a climate in which anybody who had any money to invest would not have invested it here if they had their mind in the right place. Actually, for those of you who are interested in that, Bob Higgs has a really good book uh, called uh, Depression and War, and uh, he has a whole chapter on the regime uncertainty that the Roosevelt administration created. Start, uh, the, I think this idea of uh, regime uncertainty is an important idea that basically you have to be more consistent in terms of your policy so that there's less uncertainty. That's, that's a really good idea. But the problem is that at that time, no one really knew. We are analyzing all this stuff in historical hindsight. But at that time, no one really knew what's actually going to work. So FDR tried this idea of bold experimentation. And a lot of his, a lot of his ideas were very good, and they stand to this day. Some of his ideas were obviously bad. You know, so, so I'm not saying that the private sector created all the uncertainty. I, I think the that. fundamental point of difference between our two sides is that you guys look at every crisis, whether it be the 30s or the more recent one, as you know, we just sort of start out with the crisis and, and government as the innocent bystander and it now has to rescue us. And I'm suggesting, and I think my colleagues are as well, that you guys need to do a little bit more work on the role that the government played in creating these crises. You can't just say, oh, crisis, government must have been an innocent bystander and now has to rescue us. That is uh, so fundamentally flawed as to be uh, off, really off base. Quick one for Brian, all right. Are we in danger of losing our collective memory of the 1939 recession? They said 39, but 20 million. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we, we certainly have lost the, uh, the collective memory of the 1919, 1921 uh, recession. The, the, the conditions uh, were exactly the same as 10 years later. And so the question we should be asking historically is why was there not a Great Depression in the 1920s? And there wasn't because there was a recommitment to price stability and there were significant tax cuts. There was also internationalism, too, very uh, extensive internationalism. The only correction that wasn't made was to, as, to as, as Harry suggests in his remarks, was to, was to anchor the uh, targeting of the consumer price index by ensuring a stable price of gold. If that had been done, and that was done in Bretton Woods in 1944, then you would have had a permanent boom. The Great Depression would have never occurred. Um, I, I think it's time to understand that the Great Depression occurred because of the policy mistakes of the government. I think Brian's uh, approach to the Great Depression is quite anachronistic. The idea that the Federal Reserve in the 1920s was targeting the price level, I think if you look back at monetary doctrine in those days and at Fed operating procedures, you'll see that they, they had, well, they had very little idea what the price level was because we didn't measure it in those days the way we do now. There was no consumer price index in 1925. But the, the, what, what they were trying to target was, was what they called free reserves, and, and that's a quantitative measure of the money supply. So Brian's, Brian's explanation, I think, reads back into history uh, a bunch of economic theories that have, have been concocted in the last 20 years, but that you know economists have the habit of thinking that, that everybody thinks the way they do and have for all time. And uh, that uh, It's not convincing to me. Another example of that is, I think, uh, Irving Fisher wrote his book, Money and Interest, in 1936, and he distinguished for the first time the difference between nominal interest rates and real interest rates. And the Federal Reserve, during the Great Depression, was focusing on nominal in interest rates, which were really low. Long-term interest rate was around 3.6% in 1929. But the real interest rate, because there was significant deflation, was significantly high. It was around 13%. So they didn't make the distinction between the real interest rate and the nominal interest rate. Again, that's, that's, that's something we have learned you know, since, that we have to look at real values rather than nominal values. Quick rebuttal. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the incriminating piece of evidence in, 
in my favor is that the de facto the Fed did target the price level. I mean, the wholesale price index did a, a complete reversion back to the 1913 level. The consumer price index almost did the exact same thing. So I, I, even if it's difficult to find a conscious policy on the part of the Fed, the de facto case is, is, uh, is sound. But no, the, the price level fell and the money supply was restricted. No doubt about that. But it was restricted because they focused <coughs> on the nominal interest rate rather than the real interest rate. And, and they weren't focusing on M1 or M2 either. They, they were focusing on, on free reserves, that is to say, bank reserves minus borrowed reserves. There was one more <laughs> crucial thing they were focusing on. That was not raising the price of gold. Okay. Yeah, that's true. They, that's, that, was the, that was the gold standard rule. <laughs> that, was, that was what you were supposed to do under the classical gold standard. All right, so this brings us back to present day. Um, didn't the uh, U.S. government cause the 0709 crisis by allowing um, congressional folks, uh, particularly Dems, from allowing the Bush uh, administration from reforming the, I thought I had this, the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, uh, that, well, reforming those. So Clinton deregulated those agencies in 1997. Does it matter? Why? I, I think there's a strong case to be made for that. There was an attempt by the Bush administration to rein in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and Barney Frank led the fight against that and made some ridiculous statements about how, hey, there's no problem, this is great, we're extending home ownership to more people. Uh, there was this notion in government, in Congress in particular, that it was a good thing to jawbone the banks uh, to make mortgages that in normal circumstances they would not have made to people who had no ability to sustain the payments. Uh, and then at the same time, you, uh, the Federal Reserve was keeping interest rates low for an extended period past 9-11 that uh, was flooding the banking system with easy money. So we had this circus of just throwing out all this cheap money and a lot of it being funneled politically into mortgages that should never and would never have happened in, in a genuine free market. But <laughs> wouldn't you agree, though, that the government has a role in terms of trying to create more accountability and more transparency? Sure. It, it would have a full-time job on its hands if it just made itself more accountable and more responsible. <laughs> well, yeah. but, but it, I, would, I would agree with that in, in that sense. I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, disagree with that. <laughs> it, it, but we have to think, it wasn't just Freddie and Fannie that, that caused the problems because a lot of the loans that were made, especially some of the worst loans, didn't go through them. They, you know, they weren't, you know, so this is a problem too. It wasn't just that, you know, we talk about the banks were forced to lend. The banks weren't forced to lend to anybody. They chose to do it because they saw a chance to make profits from it. And a lot of them didn't go through Freddie or, or Fannie. They went to, they were securitized through Wall Street. And some of the worst ones were generally there because people, hey, let's look, let's buy an asset. What asset is it? backed by American real estate, a AAA asset backed by American real estate, and we can buy insurance on it? Brilliant. And, and who knew that the market could screw? And, and this wasn't. It wasn't the market that was the messing. I mean, it wasn't the government that was messing things up. It was the market was mispricing these yeah, things. But Dan Fannie and Freddie were saying they're ready to buy those mortgages, too. I mean, remember, they were they were, they were buying, stuff. but not necessarily the worst ones. I mean, they weren't but buying. Yeah, the, we, we know that from 2005 to 2007, 58% uh, of the Fannie Mae mortgages were subprime and 62% of the Freddie Mac mortgages were subprime. But I, I don't think we can blame it on any one thing, right? I mean, it was a confluence of events. If it had been any one thing, we wouldn't have had where we are. Um, what really happened was there was a series of events that caused the crisis. And I would argue, and you know, this side is arguing that most of those events were caused by the government and private sector responses to what the government is doing. I mean, if you reward excessive risk taking, uh, then you're going to get excessive risk taking. How was the government rewarding excessive risk taking? Well, the government was rewarding excessive risk taking by allowing the, the uh, supply of credit to expand and by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac securitizing these things. And then the government was uh, required. When you keep interest rates that low, how do you make money? You know, ask Pete. You got to leverage, right? Well, and the government's out there in, in, telling people that they need to leverage, and so people leverage. You, you guys are talking about lowering the cost of production. One of the one of the biggest <laughs> costs of production is capital, and if you right. keep interest rates low, that fuels growth. That fueled growth in the 2000s. But the question is that there was reckless risk taking. Yeah. which was not done by the government or not encouraged by the government. It was done by the private sector because the private sector 
compensated persons who took high risk and high returns. I mean, the, the but every market. tiny little thing, there was an amendment to the Income Tax Act that changed the way that, that um, em, uh, employ, the uh, executive pay could be, which drove to a whole, uh, drove people over to um, giving them options. I mean, there's just all these sorts of tiny little things that added up to a big problem. Let me just uh, make a, a remark on the housing crisis. I mean, I think the, the hope has always been in the United States, going back to Nixon and even prior administrations, that <clears throat> we have a problem with poverty. One of the best ways to cure this is to make these people property owners. If they become property owners, they become responsible, et cetera. And so in Detroit, we had the, um, back in 68 and 69 under Romney, we had the government stepping in, there's a Republican administration, they said, okay, we're going to allow welfare payments to be uh, used to, to support mortgages. Well, the thing failed because what was happening is the people didn't have any character, even though they, they were supposedly buying these houses, they were dismantling them at the same time. And I think there's been this, through both administrations, through both Republicans and Democrats, let's try to extend home ownership. That will create responsible citizens, whatever else. And I think they have the cart before the horse. You have character first and then ownership. If you have ownership without character, it'll just deteriorate. And I think both administrations are responsible there. I mean, every, I mean you had every single administration. George Bush wanted to do it. Bill Clinton wanted to do it. Um, Jimmy Carter wanted to do it. Richard Nixon wanted to do it. And I think the, the, the premise is wrong. You have to start with character first, and that means you have a down payment where you have can put a good down payment down, then you have some skin in the game, you're shown that you've been able to save, and that creates it. All right. Harry, yeah, I, can, we, I tend we're, to agree with that. That's <coughs> that one of the one of the one of the policies which contributed to this is excessive focus on home ownership and allowing persons to buy homes when they could not actually afford them. I don't know whether it's character, I, I wouldn't put character as an issue, but they couldn't really clearly, clearly afford those homes, and they still bought them. And in fact, one of the reports said that President Bush, one of the only economic numbers he used to look at, you know, in terms of his uh, economic council, was this home ownership number, which was consistently going up during President Bush years. And he was really proud of that number. Terry, I can't believe you said that uh, it's a good thing if the government uh, injects money and credit and lowers the interest rate because that, that powers growth. If that were the case, I guess, I guess you would argue then for uh, why not have the government create enough money to lower interest rates to zero and continue to do that forever? Well, so as an economist, you surely believe in price. The price of capital must reflect the supply and demand for capital, not the whims of politicians. All right. As we long have, as the uh, price of capital is low and inflation is low, we're in cats. good shape. All right. Um, I was hoping for two more questions. I was unable to get it. If yours wasn't answered, we'll try and get these folks to answer the ones that were directed directly to them, um, and we'll put it up on the website. Um, I believe that uh, Glees Whitney had one last closing. Uh, well, I want to thank everybody who got involved in this very spirited debate. Thank you so much for the panels, the speaker. I especially, once again, want to thank our partnership. Uh, Dean James Williams has been a wonderful partner. We share office space up on the fifth floor. And we also, bottom line here, is we thank the people who make programs like this possible. Ambassador Secchia, thank you so much for your contributions to this. Before you leave, I want to make sure that we uh, reward. Uh, there, there, there is going to be a free lunch here. We're going to give you a bag. Uh, it's going to be a Ralph Howenstein tote bag for, you, for your efforts. We appreciate so much your uh, participating in this spirited debate. So we're going to get those to you now. And then we're going to come up for photographs. And then we are adjourned. Thank you very much.